Welcome to the Voice of Triumph with Roger R. Woodard, Senior Pastor of Family Worship Center located in Kings Mountain, North Carolina. Pastor Woodard's ministry is reaching a hurting world with the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Now, from Kings Mountain, North Carolina, here is Pastor Roger R. Woodard. Your choices, mind you, determined your destiny. Let me say it again. People go through life blaming everybody. I was born in poverty, so I can't succeed. Well, what's new about that? I was born in poverty. And I was voted most unlikely to succeed. And you might argue you never did succeed. But you ought to have seen me when God started working on me. People like to blame somebody else. My mom and daddy were hellions, so I can't succeed. People of color like to blame whitey. Somebody's out to get me. Somebody's always trying to stop me. My failure, and some are successful failures, by the way. It's always somebody else's fault. Well, I'm going to tell you, your choices determine your destiny. Not even God's will. You say, well, if it's God's will, I'd know. It isn't God's will that any should perish. But people are perishing every day. God has a plan for your life. It's a good plan. It isn't without ups and downs and pains and aches. But there are a lot of joys. It's a good plan, and you'll like it if you'll cooperate with it. It's not God's will that any should perish. It's not God's will that you be a, a sad story. It's not God's will that you be discarded on the road to life like used tissue thrown by the wayside. God don't make no junk. I, I think I need to say that again. God don't make no junk. God made you to succeed. Now, where God has you to plug in in our society, that's totally another matter. But if you succeed in life, then it'll be you making right choices. Well, some folks didn't like that. We are in an anti-Christian society. In this country that was founded upon the Word of God, not the Quran or any other fabrication of man, not just any ism. We, as a matter of fact, there are those who feel like in order to get pluralism established in our society and get all religions on equal footing, they have to attack Christianity. And the reason they're attacking Christianity is that this nation was built on the Holy Word of God, the Bible. And yes, we worship and honor God. The God in whom we trust is the God of the Bible, not the other isms. And boy, that could get you killed a lot of places. But we're in the society where almost every establishment is against our principles and what we stand for. I'd expect anybody to shout yet, but uh, hang around. Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and others found themselves in a hostile nation, in a hostile environment. Ours is not quite that bad, but we're getting there. Many gods... Almost anything is God. I've told you before, in India, I mean, everywhere you go, snake is God. The rat is a God. A stone out in the middle of the village that I saw with some uh, red paint on it and some garland around it, and that was a God. And when everything's God, nothing is God. That's the idea, don't you see? 
You say, well, I'm not into that, Pastor. Well, maybe you're not. Maybe you're into the God of this country, self. In our society, self is God. Money is God. Sex is God. For we're obsessed with it. I'm coming. And Daniel and his compatriots find themselves in this hostile environment where they don't even know the true God. And lots of gods. But when you have so many gods, it's easy to compromise that faith. So if they ask you to bow down to another God, it's easy to bow down because you honor all these other pretending gods. And here, I want to zero in on Daniel. And in Daniel chapter 1, in verse number 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. Purposing, determined in his heart, not going to go the way of this society. I'm not going to order my life like they do. I'm not going to try to blend in. Now listen, he wasn't a troublemaker. When they signed the proclamation that anyone that prayed to another God would be thrown in the den of lions, he didn't go out and flaunt it in front of the society just to show how defiant he was. No, the Bible said he went to his room and as he had done before, he just kept up doing what he'd always done and began to pray toward Jerusalem. But understand, to purpose in his heart in that society was to run the risk of being killed, certainly not accepted. And he purposed in his heart. But if you look up at verse number four, they picked out, watch it, children in whom was no blemish, well favored. And that's where they started choosing whom they would use. And you need to understand, it might not have been their intention to pollute them. They probably knew Nothing but what they were about to doing. But hear me well, for the lessons for this service today, your enemy wants to destroy your purity and your integrity. Wants you to compromise the doctrine of holiness, the practice of holiness. I had a pastor tell me that he had a church member. This is recent. That was just come to church so happy and so thrilled and wanted to join the church. And the lady said, well, we're so happy for you that you want to join the church. She said, yes, I went to my friend's church down in, I almost said where, down in another state. And uh, I got filled with the Holy Ghost and water baptized and speak in tongues. And uh, she said, I came back to my boyfriend and said, we... We might need to consider getting married without realizing that you, when you get saved, you clean up your life. I'm old-fashioned. I understand that. But I remember the church when people come and get saved, nobody had to tell them to quit smoking. Nobody had to tell them to quit drinking. Nobody had to tell them to quit shacking up. They intuitively knew that saved people don't conduct themselves that way. But our society, you could claim the Holy Ghost without holiness. You could have Christ without a cross. Holy Ghost without holiness. It never has been that way. It never will be that way. And you can live like you choose to. Don't judge me. I'm not judging. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. There's someone else who judges. And his judgment is true. If you're really born again, your life has changed. I read where old things have passed away. All things have become new. And you may have a past, but that's just what it is when you're born again. It's your past. Oh, yeah. Applaud or throw stones. It doesn't matter. 
And in a permissive society, you need to understand that the enemy wants to, number one, ruin your purity. Young people and not just young people. God gives you your virginity. You can only give it once. And the people that mock and make fun of those who save themselves for their true love and true mate, they may make, make fun of you, but the truth is, any day you choose to, you could be like them, but they can never again be like you. And your enemy wants to destroy your integrity with God and your purity in your body and in your spirit. I was teaching in a theological seminary in Panama. And my lesson was this. The two most important things in our walk is integrity with God and man and in intimacy with God. Those two things will keep us from a world of evils. If we want to maintain... Now, hey, listen, I assume in preaching this message that you just might want to maintain your integrity and intimacy with, intimacy with God. Not everybody does. Religion suffices for some people. Just an occasional church attendance. As I, I told many times before, and I even mentioned it this morning, hanging around the church won't make you a Christian any more than hanging around a car lot makes you a car. You have to be intentional in your walk with God. It matters whose favor you seek. As a dedicated child of God, you may at times have to walk alone. You probably aren't going to be the most favored person in your work group or in your class, maybe even in your family. I uh, was taking a course at the School of Theology where a young man from New York who had been raised nominally Catholic got filled with the Spirit at Church of God uh, revival, went back and told his friends there in the Hamptons in the fancy part of New York, non-practicing Jews and Barely practicing Catholics, he thought they'd be thrilled. Told him what had happened. I got saved. I got filled with the Holy Ghost. His dad called him aside and said, if you don't leave that holy rule of religion, I'm going to have a contract put out on you and have you killed because I'd rather you be dead than be in that religion. And he looked at me as we talked and he said, Roger, he's fully capable of doing it. And he said, I keep looking over my shoulder. But he couldn't shake him loose from that faith that he had found in Jesus. And the last I heard of him, he was on the mission field doing the work for the Lord. Let me tell you something. To own him truly, not just in word, but in deed, in this society, will cost you something. It may cost you supposed friends. What I'm saying, and on this part of what I want to preach about, let me tell you this. If you have a so-called friend, who's pushing drink, drugs, or promiscuity on you. They're not your friends. They are a satanic plant. To spoil your purity and your integrity. The devil loves to do that. You have to determine purpose. And Daniel said, not going to do it. He knew what the outcome was going to be. He just simply said, I've purposed in my heart. This is how I'm going to live. To live for God today, you have to be determined to not, according to Romans 12, to let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. But act, let God remake you so that your whole attitude of mind is changed. The King James Version puts it like that was Philip's. King James says, be not conformed to this world. How? But be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. We are what we think. And these computers between our ears, the devil wants to program them. We need baptized brains. The only way you'll make it in this society is to purpose in your heart. You're not going to conform to the pressures around you. 
as we get nearer the coming of the Lord, it's going to become more and more difficult. We have to remember we're not our own. If you claim Christ, now if you don't care, then you just tune out the rest of what I'm saying. But if you claim Christ, you're not your own. You've been bought with an awful price. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Now you are the temple of the Holy Ghost who's in you. And what are we called to do? Glorify God in our body and our spirit, which are God's. We belong to Him. We are His one and only representation to the world of what Jesus is like. We are the light of the world, even if we're a dim bulb. We're the only light they'll have. You're the only light in your world, most likely. And if your world sees Jesus, they'll see him in you. Or they won't see him. I don't mean by that we go around with a big red Bible and a smile, Jesus loves your pen, and a big word on our lips. We just are real. We don't have to put on any airs. It said that Jesus could not be hid. He tried to get away to just have a little peace and quiet and eat a meal, but the Bible said he could not be hid. I will tell you that if he's really in you, he can't be hid there either. He'll show himself to a lost and dying world. You won't have to open your mouth. The way you live your life, the way you speak, will testify who you belong to. You can't go along to get along. I'm sorry, it's just, it's easy once you make up your mind, but apparently it's very difficult for some people who want to blend in. But you can't blend in and really live for him. You don't have to rub Jesus on anybody with a great testimony every time you see him. He can't be hidden. I've told you before, second pastor at Margaret had me, I was trying to pastor the church full time and about lost everything we had and they repossessed our car and I decided to get a, a bus ticket and go a few hundred miles to my father-in-law's house get an old car I'd left, left there with him and I walked to the bus station across town in an old gray suit rain was hitting it and it looked awful I was so low I could play racquetball against the curb and this dog came out and tried to bite me. Uh, dear Lord. Even the dogs hate me. I got on the bus. I went to the back of the bus and sat down. Don't talk to me. Leave me alone. I don't want to testify to nobody. I don't want to see your face. Went in that night into the Birmingham, Alabama bus station to wait on a connection. Walked in. Sat down, sat there for a while, and said, finally, I said, you know, my brother's playing in a nightclub across town. I'll call him to come get me. And I went up to the ticket, and I asked for the phone number to the bank's lounge, and the guy looked at me, just stared at me. And when I hung up the phone, I said, I don't frequent these places. You know, my, my brother's playing there, and I need a ride. He said, well, I didn't think so. He said, you're a preacher, aren't you? I said, do I know you? No. Never seen you before, but when you walked in the door across the terminal, I said, there's a preacher. I said, my Lord. I don't want to testify to nobody. I didn't want anybody to know who I was. I wanted to be left alone with my pity party. He can't be hidden. He can't be hidden. Even when you're down and out, mad, upset, if he's in you, you're a new creature. You're a new creature. All things have passed away. All things become new. Because he's the light of the world shining through you and me. Oh. <laughs> We're not our own. Let me read something to you. Here's our purpose. Philippians 2. I got to giddy up and go here. 2, verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, 
Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring and disputings that you may be blameless and harmless. The sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. We are in a crooked and perverse nation. And we're still the light of the world. We're the only hope. I've read people who dispute it, but they get to heaven, they're going to be told by the Lord they were wrong. We're what's holding back the Antichrist and his agenda. The Holy Ghost in us. So I said, well, the Holy Ghost will be taken out of the world. The Holy Ghost is everywhere. He can't be taken out of the world. The psalmist tell us, if I make my bed in hell, he's there. If I go into the heavens, he's there. If I go to the depths of the sea, he's there. I can't get away from the presence of God, but he's not Lord everywhere. And when we're gone, he won't be Lord here, but he'll be here. What's holding back the agenda of the Antichrist is the Spirit-filled church of the living God. And when we're gone, this is going to be an awful place to be. I can liken it to Nazi Germany or some of the places in the Middle East where he isn't Lord and how God's people have to live so hard. And if you want to weigh it around and go through that tribulation period, you can do it. I, I got my reservation in another place. I've got to, Mark, you better come and give me some shut up music. You say, why should I do this? Well, you should do it because you need to know there are rewards and consequences. It's one thing to live your life the way you want to come down to your end and find out you've been a fool. Life is full of peaks and valleys. Life is full of sorrows, tragedy, and joys. You can only live a life of holiness if you really want to. There's a man in the New Testament that was in the ministry with Paul, and we don't know a lot about him. He's only mentioned three times in Paul's writings. Two of them are positive. The last, the very last entrance in the Bible about a man named Demas. Paul writes to Timothy and says, Demas has forsaken me having loved this present world. 2 Timothy 4.10 We don't know what Demas sold out for. Maybe he didn't like being in prison as Paul was. Maybe he didn't like the prospects of being beheaded. Or maybe he just found some handsome hunk of humanity that he loved better than he loved Jesus. People are selling out for all sorts of things. Money, jobs, career, flesh. This present world forsaken the calling God has given our lives. It's happening in the ministry. It's happening in the laity of churches. You have to be determined that you love Him supremely. Now, I can't promise you like the Hebrew boys that it says in Daniel chapter 1, verse 20, that they were 10 times better than the others. They had purpose they wouldn't defile themselves. And when the time came to be examined, they were 10 times better than anybody else. But you will be better than the run of the mill people that you run with. I can promise you that. That you will like the results when you make up your mind how you're going to live who you're going to serve and it's all on you ah that preacher he it's all on you Sunday school teacher all on you you can choose to carry an offense you can choose to live your life in bitterness and unforgiveness or you could choose to live free 
in the flow of the Spirit and refuse to let anyone or anything eliminate you from your heavenly reward. I, I, I read where Jesus said, if you don't forgive, God won't forgive you. Now you can try to get around that all you want to, but usually you could trust what Jesus says. I don't care if you go to a church, oh, excuse me, it doesn't matter to me if you go to a church that preaches once in grass, always in grass, never get out of grass, and nothing you could ever do to eliminate yourself and your heavenly reward, that's a lie from hell. Jesus said, if you harbor unforgiveness, God won't forgive you. Wow, that, that's heavy. That's heavy. You don't know what they did. Well, did they nail you to a cross and put a crown of thorn on you and spear your side and spit on you and cuss you? Well, don't get in that pity line until you've been there. Paul says, you have not yet resisted unto blood. And if Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest for... Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek, not weak, meek and lowly in heart. When you do that, you'll find rest for your soul. Well, that's Jesus, yeah? Well, you might want to read Paul in Ephesians chapter 4. I beseech you, what worthy of the vocation in which you're called and all lowliness and meekness. Number one, you haven't committed your life to Jesus Christ. And it's not religion. It's not church, it's not your heritage. You have to bow the heart to God and let him change you. And you may have prayed, but if there's been no change in your life, then you're not saved. That's first base. If you have not done that, you can't score if you skip first base. So if you're here and you haven't given your heart to the Lord, don't go home like that. And if you are here and you've met the Lord, but your commitment is being shaken, you need to come and recommit your life and will to His. Thank you for joining us today for Voice of Triumph. We invite you to check out our website at www.familyworship.org. There you will find information on our church service times, special events, purchase our books and music, and also information on becoming a partner as we continue to take the life-changing message of Jesus Christ to a hurting world. If you'd like to write us concerning our program, our address is The Voice of Triumph, P.O. Box 396, Kings Mountain, 28086, USA. On behalf of Pastor Woodard and the entire Family Worship Center team, God bless you, and we'll see you next week.